okay so first of all thank you so much for joining in on thursday evening and so this session i planned a long time ago but then i was talking and to omkar and everybody and then decided okay let's do this so actually these are two different sessions but when we talk about when we talk in any enterprise and in in company in actual they are quite interrelated uh uh and so i got a message no audio is my audio not available sir your no, audio is fine okay good 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 then then it's okay so devs and ops is a different topic and concept altogether uh, containers container so most of the devs devs and ops driven organizations use container that's why i tried to kind of club them together into one session but let me just but in actuality when we talk about both of these they are quite different sessions have different different type of attack surface they are handled quite differently container how is a pure technical topic or devs and ops which uh, or devs and ops which covers people people process and technology all of them so before we start who am i so my name is deep shankar yado i work as principal consultant for isec volta technologies i have been in in industry for about a decade I started as a forensic consultant and for uh, uttar pradesh police and then moved to corporate work with multiple organizations uh, i also do a lot of volunteering so i'm a part of because infosec is all about giving back to community so i also take up some positions so i'm part of indian honey net project cyber peace foundation and cdfisr disclaimer because this is very much important so whatever i'm talking about in this presentations are my views from my own uh, experience they do not represent my employer or any organization i'm associated with or any other individual all the brands i'm using in this ppt all the logos and everything you see i do not own them they are owned by uh, their respective owners uh, i'm not violating any copyright on intellectual property and this whole presentation is a result of my own experiences and very carefully crafted internet searches and good thing is that this is a technical presentation with all the non technical content so we will talk about some technical content but whatever you will see on screen is all non technical which any anybody can understand whether you have that technical understanding or not now why you should listen to me talking about data sec ops and containers because that's what i do my day job involves auditing data sec ops environments testing container security building container security designing container security controls that's what i do and how i can prove it prove this so i have implemented data sec ops in a multiple all um, in multiple organizations i have audited data sec ops environments uh one thing i take very pride in saying that i have ran containers in production so any everybody talks about i we use docker we do this 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 but when you go to an enterprise who has a saas application and who has a product which is running over internet running containers in production and running containers on your laptop is a very different scenario we'll talk about it what it takes to run a container in production so i have ran ran this i keep building different different configuration and tools uh for container security for devsec devsec op automation uh, uh recently i uh, i mean i got involved in a one project which is uh, called armor bird it's an open source project just focusing on container security so i all this uh, the <coughs> sorry all this just says that i know a thing or two about container security now let's start so as i said that these are two different topics so first topic is our devsecops where we'll talk about how we reach to devsecops because industry it industry has been there are, there are multiple development processes why devsecops came to be then what is devsecops we'll talk about some facts that okay what exactly is devsecops rather than what you see or what people say and then what are the pillars if you want to develop uh, design a devsecops program or security dev secure devops program and some point is that if you want to uh, build an organization with a devsecops environment or with devsecops culture what are the key key pointers to look at then we'll talk about containers 
in containers we'll talk about what exactly are containers so rather you see that box re representation vm versus container but in this session i'm not going to talk about that i'm going to actually talk about water containers why they matter what is container orchestration and then what it takes to run them in production so that from it side you know okay if you want if you're planning to move into containers what you need to take care of from security side you know your attack surface if somebody is planning to run containers in production you need to know how many different different components they are going to run so that you uh, you can take your security decisions then we'll talk about container attack surface and container security challenges so this is actually quite big topic so if i'm going a little bit faster you can stop me ask me you can inform me okay i'm going a little faster i'll try to keep up and slow down so let's start with DeusecOps. so DeusecOps. before understanding what is DeusecOps, we need to understand how this concept came to be and to understand that we need to understand how software development or software uh, application development industry evolved. So in 1970, waterfall, waterfall model came. Waterfall kind of became base for all the modern software development uh, methodologies. But there were many issues with water, waterfall because you had different, different steps, different, different milestones and the life, uh, life cycle of an application was way too long you used to give one requirement to your vendor and they used to take five six months to just deliver that and then after you once you used to get your software it was not as per requirement or there was make things missing then developer developers realize okay this is taking a lot of time most of the time when we are delivering the software it is not getting delivered properly there are a lot of issues in 2000 17 developers got together and they conceptualize this concept called agile in agile what they did instead of uh, developing the whole software and delivering it at once they th they divided the software into small small parts and they said that we'll make 10 features and the total time to de deliver these 10 features was called a sprint now they were getting feedbacks but there were operational issues because developers used to write code those timelines were a little unrealistic somehow they used to complete it push it to their code repository and then operation used to say hey i'm not going to push it until unless it is properly tested there was a, always a wall of confusion operations because developers want to break things they want to introduce new stuff operations want stability they don't want to touch something which is already running and there was a lot of confusion when agile came that's where developers uh, so developers and operations guys got together and they said hey why not work together let's automate most of the things which are manually required this let's automate the testing let's automate the deployment process let's automate how we are going to uh, introduce new feature instead of waiting for operations guy to actually compile it then give it to qa then qa is are going to test it let's automate whatever we can and that's how devops was won so instead of having a sprint, you, you want to release a feature, you go ahead, push your code, it goes into a testing, you approve it, it goes into uh, UAT, it, you approve it, it goes into production. So you don't have to wait about those sprints. Okay, there was some bug, now you have a six week sprint in Agile before you can fix it. You don't have, you want to fix a bug, right ahead you go, push your code into DevOps process, into your pipeline and, and it goes ahead and gets released into production and all the testing and everything was automated but security was not part of it because security is the last thing somebody thinks of and when they said okay we have automated most of the things developer writes the code they push it to their git repository automatically it goes to a jenkins build jenkins builds it gets released into testing automated test cases are run if everything is verified it goes to production but then security said you cannot go to production you need to test it we need to do source code review we need to do application testing we need to verify everything is right up to mark so even if you have they had designed a very fast system to deliver software security was still a hurdle then in 2005 a couple of security researchers also got involved in in the devops process and the concept of devsecops was born where they said instead of security being a hurdle it will become an enabler that we will 
by enabler they mean that instead of us doing everything we'll also adopt your concepts of automation we will move to left we will try to introduce security as early as possible in the software development life cycle or application development life cycle and try to give you a better result so you don't have to wait for us to give you uh, sas report dash reports it is also automated so as soon as you're pushing your code into get repository you're also getting your sas results you're also getting your software component analysis reports that part of security is all automated and the software delivery speed increase so DevSecOps is primarily if you look at from my angle DevSecOps is just shift left adoption of security where we are automating security but it's not just automation DevSecOps is more than that and we'll get uh, we'll see more of it in the further presentation So as I was talking about, so waterfall method failed. So when we started talking about modern, modern application development or modern software design methodologies, uh, water, waterfall used to fail because there was no feedback. As I said that you give a company to develop an application, they used to design the whole software, develop it and then come back to you and then you find out, okay, it is not what you wanted. There was, lack of feedback fixing a vulnerability took a lot of time fixing a bug took a lot of time and it was not as productive as it should have been then people got together they thought okay let's do agile we will so agile there's a big debate it, is it a methodology or is it a philosophy but what is i'll say is okay let's instead of building the whole software let's break it on into small small features and let's develop those features and deliver them and then take a feedback result now with agile results were better because you're delivering faster you're getting uh, faster feedback customer says hey i don't want this api to work like this i don't like this part of the ui this particular feature is not working as intentional the results were better but there were operational issues because operational guys were saying hey software version 1.6 is working if you want to introduce 1.7 we need to be sure it works and there were operational issues then they both got together they designed processes that hey developer you write the code you push it to git we will write some automation test cases over there qa will verify that automatically it will test and we will know that okay software works everything actually works as intended and will deliver it you don't have to wait for us to actually verify everything is working or not but again, as I said, security was a different silo. Even operations were automated, operations were working as, as per their speed. Everybody was, was waiting for security to give sign off or accept the risk. The, that's the biggest thing. And then everybody thought, hey, let's also bring security into the silo. We'll automate security as well, whatever we can. And the concept of DSECOPS was born. Now, again, the question is you understood the journey why DevSecOps became a concept and why uh, it is relevant today because everybody wants to deliver software fast nobody wants to wait for six weeks seven weeks to deliver one feature everybody wants uh, custom, <coughs> continuous integration and continuous delivery that is the concept of ci cd that if i want to introduce a new feature i should be able to do it without waiting for somebody else uh, if I want to deliver a software, I want to deploy something 20 times a day, I should be able to do it. That's where DevOps became prominent. But DevSecOps, again, when DevOps came, security also need to be automated because it was slowing down the speed you know, and nobody wanted that. The CICD concept says that you will be able to deliver right away. So DevSecOps is a collaboration between development operations and security so that they can all work at once. That's what DevSecOps is. There are multiple definitions. There is another definition that says, okay, it is thinking about application and infrastructure security from the start. That means when you're designing application and then selecting right tools, uh, building a culture, removing all the security gates and make sure there's a, a software delivery and DevOps flow is not slowing down. If we talk about a simple definition, DevSecOps is all about shifting left in security and making everyone accountable for security. And as everybody is talking about, I have a joke, so I have a DevSecOps jokes. If you shift, shift a little, I'll be able to tell it. 
so if we can understand anything from these uh, definitions we understand it is about making everyone accountable for security whether it is development whether it is operations whether it is security and the second thing it is about shifting left in security now what is <coughs> what is shift left so in typical organizations who do devops this is the the top layer this is how the uh, pipeline looks like they write the code they push it to git they have a ci server primarily jenkins drone hundred of different different solutions available it automatically reads code from here based on the settings in ci server it will automatically compile that code push it to system make container image whatever it is told to do then you have a test testing platform where you test okay if that application is working as intended all the automated test cases are written once the testing is passed you go ahead and push it to a repository so now talking about repository because i'm talking in sense of containers when the, nobody has in certain devops practices there is no concept of containers everybody is doing manually so after test and scan they di directly go to deploy however in container environment you also have a container registry where you say hey this particular image this particular container in torball is working perfectly you can deploy it and then you use your delivery tools cd tools you go ahead and deploy it and then you use your new relic prometheus to monitor your application shift left security means your security will also start from here you will not wait here usually before the publish step to do your sas application you will integrate your sas tool or software component analysis tool or open source uh, component analysis tool in the source code step as well so you will directly talk to git or before that you will provide your developers with the intelligent ids who can actually identify if developer is doing something wrong in the runtime that let's talk about what does that mean so let's say you have developers inside your company who are writing an application those developers uh, are using md5 and everybody in security knows that md5 is a bigger problem you should not use it because there are multiple issues there are collision attacks can be easily decrypted and so many things now how you can make sure your developers do not use md5 you can train them you can tell them 100 different time but developers have time uh, tight timeline they don't have time to listen to your security issues whatever they find best they will use it but what you can do you can actually provide some intelligence to your id using some tools so that as soon as they write up function to create md5 hash automatically it will inform them that this is insecure and it will be an automated trigger for your developers that don't use md5 similarly they push the code to git repository and that has an open source vulnerable component you can have a software component analysis tool or sas tools inside your repo automatically as soon as code is pushed it will automatically send a message to developer hey your code contains this vulnerability or your code contains this particular uh, library which has certain vulnerabilities then you go to ci server on ci server everything is built you have your unit testing there are splunk applications so you are also testing okay what when we are building this application it is built securely if you are building a container application there's no root access it is it does not has extra permission there's no compliance issue in that because on the ci side you'll also look at the compliance as you're following all the compliances then on your test side you have um, vulnerability testing so you have sonar cube you have sysdig and all those come into play then on the publish side you have registries then there are registry scanners so that you are scanning everything which is going into your registry then on your deploy side you have docker inspect you have runtime security tools something like twist lock prisma cloud compute aquasec and then on the monitoring side you have your typical monitoring tools or security monitoring tools and splunk siem and plus container monitoring tools something like twist lock prisma cloud compute and aquasec so shifting left security means that you start where the developers start you start enabling de developers not by training them but actually giving them triggers so that they can improve themselves now devsecops is not not just automation devsecops is more of a culture thing devsecops is it's not like okay you bought 10 tools you deployed there uh, you connected them to your pipeline and now you're devsecops organization no you're not until unless you build a security culture 
until unless your developers are leading charge of your security you're not a devsecops organization you just automated your security that's it devsecops is not about tools nobody can sell you any tool which can actually make you <coughs> which can actually make you devsecops compliance devsecops is not a role i see a lot of people writing on linkedin that they, they are devsecops engineers or they are devsecops lead you cannot be a devsecops lead until unless you are, you are the same guy who is writing application who is testing application who is de deploying application devsecops DevSecOps is not a single role. There are there are three different roles working together. DevSecOps is not a technology. It's not a technology which you can adopt and go ahead and you you will be happy. And most of the people are confused that DevSecOps looks like Secure SDLC. No, it's not Secure SDLC. Secure SDLC is primarily policies and processes to build secure software. However, DevSecOps is actually culture to build secure software. which contains both people process and technology which covers all the three factors if i talk about some facts so devsecops is not a tool or technology it's a concept it's a framework and the good thing it being a concept of framework is that it is open to interpretation you don't have to follow someone's model you can customize the devsecops principle as per your organization's need devsecops is all about building security culture as i said dev you cannot buy tools you cannot buy technologies you cannot buy hire people to do, do devsecops it's about building a culture that everybody starting from your ceo to that developer or to that manager or to that qa or to that intern everybody is following is responsible for some security practices and they are following some security uh, best practices based your based on your interpretation of devsec devsec ops concept and the good thing about devsec ops is that every company every development stack every scenario can have different different approach to adopt this process and again i said it's everyone's responsibility when we are talk about devsec ops everybody is responsible nobody is spared when it comes to security and automation is just a key to success automation yes a lot of things in devsecops are automate automation driven but they are not devsecops you are just automating security which will help you to achieve devsecops and it brings devsecops brings shift left vision into software security programs when you are developing software you when, when you are developing applications it brings that shift left vision so that you can start as early as in security if we talk about what are the pillars of a successful devsecops program first thing is people always start with people you need to ensure them okay they are responsible for the security security teams in devsecops <coughs> sorry security teams in devsecops program are not drivers they are enablers they just enable people to go ahead do security they do not drive those programs they kind of become a custodian okay we we need to do security but you will do it so you start as early your developers start doing security they start writing good code they start uh, writing secure code you and as a security team as a security application security lead infrastructure security lead you are responsible for providing all the training awareness and knowledge if there is a new vulnerability in a particular python package which your organization needs don't hold it to to yourself just send out an email to your developers hey in this python library there there this vulnerability and i believe we use this particular library you might want to check this out and let those developers do the job for you it's about security enablement and one of the core concept for devsecops is about making security masters or champions inside the development team the security masters and champions are not from the security team so what you do let's say you have a development team of 10 people you find out one or two guys who have interest in security who understand what is a secure code you start enabling them and you put them inside that development process that whatever code your developers are writing review that educate your developers and if i am an appsec guy that's the, that's the first thing i do i take up those developers who have interest in security i start enabling them because at the end of the day it is reducing my job once a good code is coming from development side i will not find much vulnerabilities i don't have i don't have to spend that much time f 
figuring out those small vulnerabilities. I I can focus on actual research, finding out logical vulnerabilities, well, well, logical vulnerabilities or ch chain vulnerabilities instead of just looking at and finding out, hey, there is an open SQL statement which may lead to an SQL injection. Second part of DevSecOps, second pillar of DevSecOps process is uh, processes. So when we are talking about automation, so automation is not like, okay, you go ahead, you you have gone ahead, you integrated your tool to CI CD pipeline and it is automated. You also need to define processes. If there is a vulnerability, critical vulnerability, what to do? There's a high level vulnerability, what to do? Who will get these reports? How you're going to handle false positives? What will be the priority? If there is any still manual approach, how you can update that? You will have to define threshold so that okay. Low level, low level vulnerabilities with CV score zero is okay for you. But a critical vulnerability with the CV, CV score 9.5 plus is never okay for you. Or a vulnerability with more than 5.0 CV, CV, uh, CVSS score is not okay for you. You will define process for Git review. You will also check for credentials. So, uh, <coughs> you will also check what they are pushing as part of the code. Are they pushing any secrets inside the code which may lead to, because everything is automated you don't have visibility what is happening on the code side. If some I write a export API key is equal to my API key that might go to production and somebody from the source code can find that key and do much harm. And there have been written attacks about that, that developer hard coded the key, nobody looked at it and that key ended up being in production. And some attacker found out that key, they used it and they, uh, they, they wrecked havoc inside the organization. You also, make processes for peer review, security champion review, that whatever code is going on, security champion will review it from the security standpoint. So you're not spending much time. You're, if you're a SAS guy inside your organization, before you are security champion is reviewing that everything is fine. We are not using insecure functions. We are not doing MD5. Uh, we are not keeping open SQL statements. Uh, we are not hard coding anything. So that when it comes to you, most of the vulnerabilities are already flushed. You're getting a good secure code where you need to use your mind to find out anything logical or chain. And then how you're going to do change management in DevOps process. It's not like you have created a pipeline, developer is pushing into Git. As soon as it is pushed, it is getting into your production line. No, it will never be like that. How you're going to manage chain management in automated process. Now in DevSecOps program, third pillar comes as technology how you're going to do secret management. And usually, so this is actually written in order, uh, in a order how you should deploy DevSecOps program in terms of technology. Usually what people say you should do SaaS first, but that's a wrong approach when you are an organization because SaaS gives a lot of false positives. The maximum number of false positives you can get from any tool inside your security architecture that is SaaS. So before SAS, you actually need to look at secret management because the, I have audited more than 50 different, different uh, uh, automated pipelines. And the biggest issue I find that in the master branch, there are hard coded secrets. Developers wrote them, commented them, nobody checked them and they got into the final master branch, which is deployed in production. So the first thing you should implement is the secret secret management process that how you're going to handle all those secrets, all those API keys, all those credentials, then software component analysis. This is very much required today because this whole DevOps concept brought a lot of use of open source into your technology stack. Instead of developers writing all everything from scratch, they use pre-built components from the internet and those pre-built components have vulnerabilities. Open source is not secure. Open source has vulnerabilities and they have far more critical vulnerabilities than your typical enterprise software. So you also need to have a software component analysis process, analysis tool to look at those open source vulnerabilities. After that, you can do SAS. Again, deploying tool is not enough. You'll have to fine tune it. You will have to kind of build your processes. You'll have to deliver quality results. Then you can have DAS, your IST, RAS, infrastructure, cloud security, and monitoring. But if you are starting from ground up, the first thing you need to do in, in terms of technology is to have a secret management. 
now we are kind of on the last part of the devsecops devsecops how to implement it so the first thing you have to do you have to kind of stop being a driver stop thinking of as a security leader let developers lead the charge create security champions create security masters inside your development team train them knowledge share them let them come up with the security solutions because developers want one thing they want to make cool software they want to make secure software they don't have timelines they do and they don't have people to teach them how to do that but when, once a developer who understands security teaches them in their own language they understand fast as a security guy who has never done development you you'll not be able to speak their language the only value i get doing this consulting consulting from the for different different companies because i have been a developer in my past life so i understand their language i understand how they think how what they are going to understand if i say you should not use md5 they will say hey this is a strict guideline but when i explain them what will happen if they keep using md5 and how they can make sure that using their ide tool they never use md5 again they are quite happy security guys we so what from my experience what i have seen that security guys fear automation we want to do things manually automation is not all bad you should embrace it you should uh, because once an organization is moving to devops they'll have to move to devsecops you cannot be a hurdle anymore you cannot go ahead and uh, say no you cannot uh, go to production because we haven't tested it out and no company is going to wait for you because at the end everybody listens for business and business wants features to be delivered as early as possible so you'll have to embrace automation but not just automation you'll also have to prioritize the results of that automation so let's say you ran a sas tool which did a source code analysis which is obviously going to have more than 40% false positives don't de deliver the that automated report look at the, that report prioritize what needs to be fixed first all vulnerabilities are important but some are more important you need to as a security professional working in a devsecops devsecops environment you need to understand this that all vulnerabilities are important that is okay but some vulnerabilities are more important so you need to prioritize what they need to patch first provide that those prior prioritize reports to developers and they will actually appreciate you instead of hating you because there has been an kind of cold war between developers and security team and devsecops actually tries to uh, end that cold war and how it can be ended when you become enabler instead of driver you become supporter instead of being a hurt, hurdle in, inside the software uh, uh, software process software development process again make security and everyone effort that means in devops we call something called a story so every feature which is which needs to be designed is called an story so whoever is responsible for thinking that a story they should you actually train them to think about security as well a development journey is, uh, a development process is called journey so whoever is involved in that journey of building that particular feature they are also responsible they are thinking from the security side and this is only possible when you do knowledge sharing when you enable them and don't become a hurdle embrace continuous learning whatever you learn whatever your developers have learned keep that knowledge base keep updating your processes keep updating your people keep updating your technology it's not like you have bought an vulnerability management tool or you have bought a saas tool and this is enough also keep testing keep experimenting okay what new you can do how you can improve this if particular saas tool is not able to solve this particular problem are there any other tools who can solve solve this problem or is there any way which you can solve this particular problem encourage open collaboration so whenever you are building a security design don't make it a security team decision involve developers as well and once you start involving them they will take interest that okay what do you guys do whatever you do is not a hurdle but an actual requirement for your business share threat intelligence as i said there is a new vulnerability you, security teams are the first to know inform all the developers I mean, that intelligence means nothing to you 
but for developers that is something they can actually look at if they are using that particular library or if they are using that particular code component they will they can actually go ahead and fix it and the first step for any DevSecOps program that you need to perform a thorough security needs assessment you need to actually look at what your organization needs. As I said, there's no fixed pattern that this is what you need to do, say, DevSecOps. It's a concept, it's a framework. Frameworks and concepts are open to interpretation. And then set up monitoring. In, secure, in DevSecOps, uh, DevSecOps environment, security teams are more of a monitor, enabler. You monitor what is happening instead of going ahead and doing it. Let others do it for you. You involve there, you monitor if something is happening correctly, good. If something is happening not correctly, you go ahead, enable those guys. Okay, this is, you're doing wrong. This is the way to fix it. So that's what DevSecOps is. So before we move to another topic, if anyone has any questions on DevSecOps, we can take it right, right here. And then we'll move to uh, another, another topic, which is containers. Right, Smitha, that makes sense before we move to another topic. Uh, yes, I just enabled the chat screen so uh, everyone can put their questions on chat. Yes, so I have received some private call, uh, some questions in my private window. So I'll take it. Uh, Kiran, how is HDLC followed in Dev DevOps practice? How do you demonstrate? So as I said, that HDLC, so secure HDLC, is not DevSecOps. They are bo both different concepts. Secure SDLC is a more of a process thing. DevSecOps is more of an engineering thing. So think of DevSecOps as an AppSec professional doing your job for you, who is doing SAS, DAS, and everything for you. SDLC is just a set of rules that you will you will do this to make secure software. And that is up to your developers to actually follow that if they want to do it so do do this or not that's why most of the time secure sdlc programs fail because they are developers don't follow those practices because they are not able to comprehend what from where you're co coming devops actually enables developers to see your points as well good tools for sca so uh, prashant uh, okay so this guy, question i cannot answer is straightforward because that is highly dependent on your platform what type of platform you're using uh, what what type of uh, programming languages you are using? So there's Snake, there is check marks, uh, there's Fortify. Everybody is doing some sort of uh, uh, source code analysis. Then there there are multiple open source projects as well who are doing SCA for you. But that is very specific to your requirement. What you do inside your organization? Can you suggest any good certificate for DevSecOps? As I Mahendra, as I said, it's not a role. So DevSecOps is. Okay, so there are people who offer DevSecOps certificate. There's a DevOps Institute, which offers DevSecOps certificate, but the certificate will actually teach you what I have told you in the last 30, 40 minutes. Can you suggest tool for knowledge base? Wiki, best tool for creating knowledge base. And if, if, if you want to go ahead, create Confluence, G, create Confluence repos and everything. What is NetOps role? So NetOps primarily covers network operations. Uh, so in DevSecOps, uh, recently NetOps is also part of uh, DevSecOps because of, of the use of containers. However, it is again a very different silos. Could you suggest and share audit checklist for DevSecOps process? Would you? So as I said, DevSecOps is open to interpretation for different, different organizations. So there's no fixed checklist and audit list. You'll have to review your own organization follow DevSecOps principles, which are there on your screen and see if you're doing everything or not. How can DevSecOps help in cloud security? Nice question, Divya. So cloud security, again, DevSecOps actually helps a lot because when somebody moves to cloud, they move to automation. And once they move to automation, that means they are following DevOps. They want to deliver software fast. And how, how you will ensure security when somebody, a developer, is writing code and it is directly going into production with all the automated testing. So DevSecOps actually helps you to manage your cloud compliance, helps you to manage your security in, in a cloud environment so that whatever microservices and all those things you are delivering, they are secure. You can have some guarantee and you don't become a hurdle because 
when we talk about cloud, we talk about automation in terms of software delivery. And is DevSecOps more of a policy driven approach? No. So as I said, DevSecOps is not is combination of all three. So it's not just policy. It's also people. It's also technology. Please tell us a step by step approach for a security person. Uh, Mahesh, can you uh, rephrase your question? I'm not sure if I understand that correctly. Do developer wants to go to uh, before? Wants to go for advanced training before we go for Dev DevSecOps? No, uh, it's not like developers have to learn security before you go for Dev DevSecOps. Uh, uh, so it's not like that. Develop your current developers, you start enabling them because DevSecOps, you do not complete DevSecOps process is one day. It's a process. It can take one year, six months to completely get onto that platform. So your current developers with their current knowledge base they start, you start knowledge sharing with them. You start training them. What is secure coding practices, how to write secure code, and they can go ahead there. You don't have to send them to any specific training to learn DevSecOps. Uh, can we, so MD5 is not uh, so it's not an encryption algorithm so you cannot decrypt you can decode it yes there are multiple attacks uh, that's why md5 is most of the people have used to sha1 or sha256 nobody uses md5 anymore can you suggest uh, good books on devsecops yes there are uh, devsecops manual and most of the stuff is available on the internet you don't have to buy any books devsecops.com covers most of the things DevSecOps is a framework. Is there any written framework like uh, Nest and Multiple? No. So it's not a written framework. It just has rules that, okay, this is what you should do in an automated DevOps, uh, DevOps driven development environment. As a security leader, I may be concerned about security and want to implement DevSecOps, but unless uh, development teams uh, decides to change their model to DevOps, we cannot move forward. Any help in terms of creating business cases to come? So Mahesh, as a security leader, so as I said, you are just an enabler. You are not a driver over here. If your development team does not want to move to DevOps and I'm pretty sure they must have uh, their own reasons that, okay, why they don't want to do DevOps. There are a lot of companies who, is who are still using Scrum, who are still using Agile and it's not a bad thing. You don't need DevOps. DevOps is not a remedy for all your problems. If you're creating a monolithic app, which has a very huge code base, you cannot have DevOps over there. You don't need DevOps over there. So it, if your development team is not presenting some good uh, pointers that why they don't want to move to DevOps, you can always uh, talk to your business that, okay, how it is going to uh, improve your software delivery. But if they don't, if you're dealing with an application where rapid delivery, rapid integration is not required, you don't need DevOps because DevOps is all about delivering features fast. I want a search, search function on webs, my website, but I did not had before. My developer will write a code in eight hours. I'll push it. I have that feature ready. That's what, Dev, that's what uh, DevOps lets you do. That, okay, you don't have a feature. You want that feature. You write that code, push it forward. You don't have to wait for that sprint to end. But if your development team says that, okay, and your business does not allow that, then you don't need DevOps. For DevSecOps, do we only learn application security? So, okay, so this answer is kind of yes, because everything is developers dev driven, developers do application security, developers write applications. So it is considered modern application security practice as well. But when we introduce containers, when we introduce, uh, Docker, Kubernetes and everything, then infrastructure also becomes part of DevSecOps. But however, if you're still deploying manually, uh, just for not using containers, then it is just application security and a modern application security practice, if I say. How to implement DevSecOps in Altation Jira? So as I said, Kamal, it's not about tools. So you cannot develop, uh, implement DevSecOps in Jira. Jira is just a tool which you can leverage to actually go ahead and uh, uh, implement and track process for your uh, deployment, but there's no way to use Jira to implement DevSecOps. 
yes atul so i know this uh, practical devsecops uh, devsecops university so they do a lot of there are multiple companies who do, do a lot of certificates but as as i said it's more of a framework it's open to interpretation there are principles which you need to follow kartik sas has lots of false positive bus and faster but shift left approach and binary scan comes very late in the picture with good results how one can, can balance so so karthik once your code is good it will go to a ci pipeline anyways where the code will be built then that's where you integrate your dash tools dynamic application security tools so because you cannot test a binary until unless it is built you integrate your dash tools on the build step itself so that's where that's how you balance that you it's as i said it's not just about that is it dash iast infrastructure security everything can we say devops service ops is automation of functional testing security testing deployment uh, using defined process and rules man to some extent yes but it's more than that at as i said there is a cultural element of that devops ops also has that cultural element so it's just not automation it's more than that so you also need to build that culture that whatever results are coming from these testers they are actually being analyzed and there's a con continuous learning environment do you have any an idea to share uh, how to sell devops idea to top management to get them involved again abhishek i don't know what type of uh, applications you build how how you are designing those applications so i cannot say that how as i said if you're developing an application which is quite monolithic uh which is quite broad in sense uh, uh which is quite big and uh, does not uh, requires features delivery as fast as Devo devops offers you don't need devops so if you want to pitch your idea then you you'll have to actually go with the line of uh, uh you'll have to uh, talk about that okay hey if we want to introduce a new function into our application in our saas service if we use Dev devops we can deliver it faster so that we don't have to wait wait for sprints and everything so that's how you can propose but I, that is will, that will be your interpretation devops and devsecops are open to interpretation the requirement implementation differs from organization to organization prashant as i said that hca tools there are multiple hca tools uh, depending on your infrastructure what you are you are using python so there are some tools who do good python but they don't they are not able to do node modules there are some good tools who who can do node modules but they are not able to do a uh, python or clang or all those so you'll have to see your languages what languages you are using what software components you are using and based on that you'll have to take that decision is oas part of devsecops how one can implement this in sdlc process so sdlc and uh, devsecops different oas is a vulnerability so the, these three things are uh, uh, quite different they are interrelated yes they complement each other but they are not uh, a part of anything they they just complement each other what factors should we consider before moving to devsecops from a non devsecops environment cost and complexity good question so first thing before moving to devsecops you need to actually see your if your organization is on devops at least they are following devops devops principle uh, they are delivering features faster they have a proper pipeline built in for software delivery they don't have that wall of confusion which we usually see inside the pipelines everything is working properly then you start in introducing security as i said you start from software component analysis then move forward to source code review dash iast and infrastructure review the cost and complexity is quite a variable complexity yes it's complex to implement it's not easy i'm not going to say that okay you can do it easily because building culture takes efforts uh okay sir was for mahesh you have replied SCA tools cover third party components yes so there are multiple SCA tools who, who actually cover open source components as well so something like snake or checkmarks uh, they actually cover open source components as well so all the third party components if if your developers are using something from internet that can also be covered so i think i have answered all of the questions you if you have anything we can take in take it in the second half now let's move to containers if i have missed anyone anyone's question you can post it again because there are so many messages suddenly so i might have missed it i'm so sorry for that i have not ignored you on intention you can post it again i'll i'll be very happy to answer that now let's move to container 101 for security teams 
Yes. So water containers. So this is the joke I'll be keeping throughout this section that water containers, containers used to supply goods from different different continents to different different places. But what are actual containers in computer sense? So Linux containers are software applications. So these are definitions from opensource.com and redhat.com. And just read that and get confused. I want you to get confused. Linux containers in sort contain application softwares in a way that keep them isolated from the whole system that they run on. Containers allow developers to package up an application with all of the parts it needs, such as libraries, other dependencies, and ship it out as one package. Second definition, containers are a form of operating system virtualization. A single container might be used to run anything from a small microservice to a software process to a larger application. Inside a container, there are all necessary executable binaries, libraries, and configuration files. If we understand anything from these two definitions, so you can say that container is an application which has all its binary built in with it. So let's say my application wants to do use Python 3.5. I don't have to install Python inside my host machine. That application will also have Python in, in built in it. That's what we understand from this definition. And everything is packaged as one. Kind of true in terms of written uh, explanation that okay, containers, yes, they cover all their de dependencies, all the uh, libraries, all the parts they need inside them. You don't have to take, uh, you don't have to install anything on the base machines for containers to run apart from the container engine. If my application wants to use Ruby on Rails, I don't have to install Ruby on Rails on my base machine. My container will have Ruby on Rails inside it. So that's what we understand. But these are just definitions. How do humans see containers? This is how you see containers because before understanding containers, you should be able to actually visualize them, how they look like. When you see Nginx, you actually visualize an application that, that is running on your, on your machine, which, is, which, is, which has capability to accept requests. So you know how Nginx looks like, but how containers look like? Okay, containers look like this, that's good. Then there is Docker, there is LXT, there is uh, different, different container D. And this is how marketing guys and those corporate guys want, uh, they want you to visualize containers. So there is a box, which is host. On top of that, there's another box, which is operating system. Then they say there is another box, which is container engine. And on top of that, there are your containers. So this is the marketing and probably if I'm quoting the office, this is what corporate wants you to know that how containers look like. But containers are not boxes. There's no concept of boxes inside your system. You, you cannot create boxes inside your computer. Inside your computer, containers are processes. So this is, this is an screenshot from my machine. You see, I did PS aux and I tried to grip Nginx. I don't have any Nginx process. What then I, what I did, Docker run. Docker is a container runtime engine. I said run Nginx. I did Docker PS which showed me, hey, my Nginx is running. Then I grabbed Nginx and you see there, there are two processes running. So how computers see process, uh, container, how computers see containers? Containers are just processes for your computer. They are not boxes. They are not uh, unicorns which are running inside your Linux kernel. No, they are just processes. A complete process which has all its binaries, all its dependencies inside it. They are just process, normal, simple processes. So this is a top output of the same machine where you can see I, I have my Nginx running. So they are just running as a processes. Now coming to the actual definitions. Container is a process or a group of processes. So I'm just running Nginx, but inside Nginx I can have Python, I can have my Flask running. So combination of processes, but with more isolation from OS than your ordinary process, but with less isolation from VM, which comes with the trade-off of less security. I added this line over here because processes share kernel. And when we talk about containers, there is a big security issue with uh, container that, okay, they share a same kernel space. 
that means whatever features these whatever kernel features which allow these containers to be they are your attack surface in vm you don't have that uh, when it comes to isolation you don't have those security issues there's a book called the containers operators manual this is how they define containers containers are processes born from tarball anchor to namespaces controlled by c groups now if you're not a linux guy or if you have never used linux i'm pretty sure you will be confused so let's ex let me explain you what are namespaces and c groups so namespaces and c groups are kind of a special features of linux kernel so there's no container feature inside linux kernel there's nothing called container inside linux kernel space or linux operating system or unix space container uses different different linux features uh, so these different different linux features actually make containers possible now what is namespace so let's start with the namespace so typically you have a process what namespace does namespace actually defines that what this process can see so let's say i'm running nginx process with the help of linux namespace i can define that what this nginx process can see can it see that python process running can it see that uh, uh, uwsgi wisgi sock running what uh, file system it, uh, uh, for what file systems it, it can access so namespace actually controls your process awareness what that particular process can see so that's what we mean by isolation. So for your isolation, namespace is responsible. Namespace makes sure that, okay, that process is isolated because it cannot see anything else. You have your whole operating system outside, but this particular process can only see these six processes and this drive, nothing else. Then C groups. C, C groups are primarily kernel feature that limit that what this process can use because processes can go ahead uh, take up all your cpu they can take up all your ram c groups actually make sure that if you decide that this particular uh, process is going to take 2 gb maximum 2 gb ram and 4 cpus then it will only take up that so this is a way to control process inside the linux operating system or linux kernel that what particular process can do what it can see and how much resources it can do and these two these two are the more, more prominent features of Linux kernel, which allow containers to be. So you understood that container is a process which is controlled by namespaces that what it can see so that it, it has a isolation and by control groups or C groups that what it can use, how much resources it can use. So what you typically see that box representation where you have a VM versus container start think, stop thinking about containers in a way that they are mini VMs start thinking of container if you're a security guy start thinking of containers that they are just processes that's it and now you know they are processes processes have been there since ages how they became so much popular so this is the most apt meme i can find that why containers are popular Developers have a very big problem. It works on my machine. They wrote a code, fancy code, it ran, it was working on, on their machine, but as soon as it went out, it is not working. And now, story time. That, uh, this is just to show you that, okay, this problem is very real. So you, your company or you decided to build a very cool, app, uh, very cool application and you decided to use Ruby on Rails. You go ahead, do gem install rails then you don't have make so you go ahead install make then you install uh, then you retry for installation again it is not installing because then you have library errors but you went ahead spend a lot of time on a stack overflow finally found find found out that how you can install rails gem package done now you have also developed your application application is done running on your laptop you go to your infra team, hey, I want to deploy this in production. Right? That's what you do. You say, I want to deploy this in production. They buy an EC2 machine, you connect to that EC2 machine, and as soon as you connect to it, the first command you need to run, gem install rails, because EC2 does not come with rails. And back again. But eventually, you are a good guy, you worked with your operations team, you made sure, okay, you are able to install everything. 
eventually you got your applications working everything is working uh, inside your production but suddenly there is a news and what what is that news what is that news that ruby on rails fixes multiple input validation vulnerabilities now you are using this ruby on rails version you need to patch it because they have vulnerabilities somebody could hack your cool application vc can take all vc can take up all the funds they have given to you back and as soon as you write bundle update rails it fails again now you are frustrated that hey i built this cool application which was running fine very cool idea i have got a lot of funding for this but there is a vulnerability on my backend platform i cannot patch it because if i go for patching it it breaks something else operations are angry on you your management is angry angry on you and your life is a mess containers actually simplify that instead of installing everything manually there are officially certified container images which are which everybody knows are working because if i am taking from something from ruby repository when if i do gem install rails that means i am downloading something from ruby repository that is a trusted ruby also made a container image which you know works you don't have to fiddle around stack overflow you don't have to worry about all those dependencies because this particular image has all the dependency it needs to run rails and for upgrading it you just need to update the version then you go ahead put your code inside this container expose your port run your application they make your life simple so whatever in the previous slides whatever you have seen that i am upload installing make i am installing all the packages everything and then i am doing the same thing on the production i don't have to worry about it i will write a container image i'll push my code inside it i'll have a container image up and running with my application in, in it i'll just push it the same i'll push the same to production i don't have to repeat all these steps which i have done on my laptop to that server which i have bought from amazon they make life simple that that's why they became so prominent in the concept of devsecops because if your de deployment is manual you are still dealing with dependencies nobody wants to deal with dependencies no matter from which team you are you don't either a developer operation security you don't want to deal with dependencies how do you solve dependency problem if the, if there was there was a way to actually if there was a good way to actually build application in a package that all the dependencies and everything are in built containers help you do that that's why container became so prominent so developers write developers write a code that code goes into a build tool that build tool instead of deploying it manually on a server dealing with all the dependencies they build a container image which can be used throughout irrespective of the platform you don't have that platform dependency that okay developer was using windows machine but where you are deploying that is a linux machine you don't have to worry about it how to deploy all those all those things so this is why containers became so prominent and containers are processes now we are clear that what are containers why they became very prominent there is a another term which is used a lot with containers it's container orchestration but what is container orchestration so let's say you have a container registry container registry you can think of uh, as a github for containers uh, where you keep all your container images and you have built different uh, 50 different containers with the microservices different different microservices inside different containers and you want to deploy that usually all the examples you see of deploying container on a single machine but when you when we talk about enterprise you don't have single server you have n number of servers how you are going to make sure how you are going to make sure that you are deploying all these 50 containers correctly on correct servers where all the resources are available how you are going to schedule this deployment so server one has 6 gb ram but there is one container which requires 8 gb ram now you need to make sure that this that 8 gb ram container gets deployed on server 4 because only server 4 has 8 gb ram how you are going to ensure that everything is deployed correctly then you have operations issue what if one container dies how you going to respawn it you cannot have enough people to do uh, go ahead uh, do docker ps on each machine find out what is running what is not running and then deploying everything manually because that would be insane right so that's where the orchestration comes into play 
container orchestration is a way to automate container deployment that's what container orchestration is it takes care of all the configuration it takes care of all the scheduling how they will be deployed it also takes care of all the availability clauses of the container that okay if a container is dying it will automatically restart it it will also take care of the allocation of resources between containers that okay if particular containers want 3 gb ram container uh, four cpus particular containers want uh, particular container wants 8 gb ram 10 cpus it you just write that into a code format and it will take care of it load balancing traffic routing service discoveries because when we talk about containers we don't have ip addresses anymore everything is a service how would one container know how to talk to another container how would my python application container know where is my mysql database what is the name what is the ip address how how to connect to that mysql database because we don't have ip addresses we have services so orchestration also takes care of this service discovery health monitoring if one of the container is dying or if one of the container has any issues how you're going to take care of it and container or orchestration also takes care of how one container is going to talk to another container how one docker container is going to talk to another docker container are they going to use tls are they going to use authentication how that traffic can be hidden because another big problem you have with containers that there's an open traffic that means and by open traffic i mean that anybody any container can see other containers traffic if they have network permission they also so orchestration also takes care of all the permission that what permission one container can have now what are these container orchestration tools they are openshift mesos rancher kubernetes docker swarm kubernetes you have heard a lot these are the tools which actually allow you to deploy containers at a scale with automation on different different servers all the examples or everything you see on the internet they talk about one machine but in, in enterprise you don't have one machine you have 100 machines working together so how you're going to ensure that you're, you're deploying them correctly you need to use some orchestration tools and orchest orchestration tools help you do that there's a dedicated uh, session i take on container orchestration security but here i'll stop on the orchestration we'll move to what it takes to run containers in prod however we, we can always schedule i'll talk to gaurav and everybody to schedule another session just on container orchestration or kubernetes security if time allows now and this is uh, this topic is very important what it takes to run containers in prod because when your organization is moving to a container environment it it's not just container engine on your development environment on your laptop you can have docker and with that docker you can run all your containers but in production container engine is the base thing that is the one thing you require to containers you have your container engine you can run your docker images lxd images container d images but you need to deploy it on n number of servers that means you need orchestration managing orchestration is not easy it's a co complex process every every orchestration platform kubernetes rancher openshift works differently so you need people who can manage this orchestration then networking as i said there's no concept of ip addresses it's all services exposed over apis and different different endpoints how you're going to manage networking inside container environment when there is no concept of a ip addresses how you are going to push updates you push an update for one container which is dependent on second container or uses a similar database as second container it might break your whole architecture how you are going to make sure that a schema database schema allows for both containers to live in and provide all the information how you are going to manage a hybrid environment where half of the things are running on container half of the things are running on on prem or how you are going to manage that okay let's say you have improved or done any changes into one container it is not breaking everything else how you are going to take care of rolling updates you need to take care of rolling updates in container and environment and prod as well then monitoring how you are going to monitor your containers are running properly there is no issue and the biggest problem with containers containers are ephemeral by ephemeral i mean that that they, they live for a very short time if something happens they will die and if containers die 
your data is also lost, which is inside the container. So how you're going to ensure that all the data which is being generated by these containers is stored securely somewhere and you can do a forensic. So let's say some attack happened on your organization. Some API was open that has a SQL injection and somebody hacked into it. But by the time you went to do forensics, the container restarted itself. All the data is gone. So how you're going to do forensics, how you're going to do incident response. And this is my personal experience. As I said, I do a, I'm a DFI, DFIR guy and I belong to a kind of a middle way from offensive and defensive, both security. That's why I usually, I say that I'm a purple team guy, hence the PPT color is purple. So I look after both sides of security, but when I go as an incident responder in a container environment where everything is ephemeral, and by the time I reach there and that container is gone, a new container has been spawned. I don't have relevant data to look at what exactly happened. I, I rely on all these edge devices to tell me what happened, but I don't have that exact data. So you need to set up a monitoring processes. Then supervision. You're running. So I recently I audited an organization which was running more than 1000 containers. Monitoring thousand containers is not easy because you don't know which container is running, which container is giving errors, which container uh, has restarted. So how you're going to manage supervision? That's another thing you need to look at. And each and every step, if you're a security guy, you can actually imagine an attack surface over here. Each and every step, whatever I'm introducing, there is an attack surface associated with it. How you're going to make sure Configuration changes are happening because I said everything dependency and everything is inside the container. And let's say a developer wrote a cool container inside the de development environment, but it was connect connected to development database. You want to move to prod. That means you want to change the database details. You also want to change the, I hope you want to change the username password as well. You're not using the same username pa database password in production and UAT both. So you also need to make sure define a process, define a technology way define an automation for configuration changes as well. Then service discovery. How would one container talk to another container? And let me tell you, there are dedicated startups with millions of dollars of funding just for service discovery. They do one thing, service discovery in container environment. Now you have everything ready. You have figured out, okay, what is happening in the containers? This is my container architecture. This is how it going to be. I'm going to use Kubernetes. Uh, I will use uh, Kubernetes supervision D service. I, I will use STO for uh, service discovery. I will use some SIEM for monitoring. I have defined processes for rolling updates. You have figured everything out. Now where, where to host it? Do you want to keep everything on-prem? Do you have people who can build that on on-prem architecture? Okay, you want to keep it in cloud. Have you done your cost analysis on cloud? Do you think it is feasible for you to, if you're banking, uh, if you're a bank in India, you cannot move to cloud because they have data centers outside, how you're going to take care of those compliance requirements. So you also need to look at container hosting where your data is hosted. And then you have another security requirement. If you're hosting in cloud, then you need to ensure of cloud security as well. But let's say you have somehow figured out. Another issue is code quality. You're using open source third party in containers. Most of the time you will use some public images. Let's say you want Python container image. You're not going to create your own Python image. You will use the image which has been provided by Docker Hub or different, different registries. How you're going to ensure that that image is good, has no vulnerabilities. It is working perfectly or it, it is, it has uh, the risk label for that uh, uh, particular container image. It uh, is at a acceptable risk level if I talk in CSSP language. So how you're going to ensure the quality in container environment and at the end, because again, security is the last thing you care about in, in, in any business security is the last thing they care about. So how you're going to ensure security. So this is what it takes to run a container environment in production. It's not just you will install Docker, which they typically teach you in trainings that, Hey, run this script file. You will have your container, uh, orchestration platform, Kubernetes single node ar uh, architecture will be running. No, you don't have a single node uh, cluster in production. You have a multi-node cluster. And when you have multi-node cluster, you're running hundred different containers. It's not just running Kubernetes. It's more than that. And this is what it takes 
to run run containers in production and that's why i said when i said that i effectively ran containers in prod this is what i had to do to actually run all these containers in production i had to take care of each and every process i'll have to uh, i had to define each and every security practice associated with it then only i was able to run it effectively now you know that okay what it takes to run containers in prod uh, prod we, let's talk about container attack surface as i said initially that containers share kernel among each other that means if five containers are running on a single machine they will share the same kernel space that means every kernel feature they are using is an attack surface for you like name spaces control groups there are exploits available for linux kernel which exploit some vulnerabilities in name spaces c groups they can also exploit your kernels uh, containers there are configuration issues with containers you ran an image with root and that that image as i said it's a process that that means that process is running as root on your host machine there's a capability attack surface that okay my container has a capability that is called uh, inter process uh, inter process communication capability if i i have an ipc capability i can read the memory you know when a container when a process can read everything that is going on in memory they can do a lot then you have content trust whatever you are putting inside your container image do you trust it can you be sure that okay it is secure then volumes what containers can access name spaces you have allowed slash partition for containers to access that means you have opened your whole whole storage to containers they can access anything and if that container gets compromised everything gets compromised networks how are you going to ensure net network security so each and everything that container uses has some attack surface related to it and if i talk about orchestration and everybody likes threat matrix because attack in mitre and everything this is your kubernetes attack threat matrix so for initial access somebody can take your cloud credentials there is a compromised image in your registry your kube kube config file got exposed your dashboards are exposed this is the most common vulnerability i see in the container environments because you create a, when you are using containers you create a lot, so many dashboards and these dashboards actually uh, help you to monitor everything but they also contain all the juicy data which somebody can look at and attack your infrastructure then exec into container bash is running somebody so there are there are certain new features have come up in kubernetes which can allow me to attach my container into a current running container their concept is called sidecar that means i can run my malicious container inside your container environment and you will never figure out what exactly happened because it is attached to your current running container so you have a full perfectly defined attack matrix and just to understand how important containers are in the market that microsoft has written this document Microsoft, which rarely used to do any open source, they are writing attack matrix for an open source uh, project. Kubernetes is an open source project, so you can understand that security is so much required in the container environment. Now let's talk about some container security myths. You have understood attack surface. I talked about both the attack surface. Yes, there's a detailed talk I usually do, so we'll see if we can do that de dedicated session on container security. Then I'll talk detail about. We'll also do some hands-on exercises on that. But these are the top five myths you will hear about containers from the Dev DevOps vendor. So if any DevOps vendor comes to your organization which says use Kubernetes or use uh, in any container technology these are the top five myth myths they will tell you first thing containers are secure by default no they are not by default they are very unsecure because they have root access everything is open to them compliance is hard with containers no it is not it is actually quite easy to manage compliance with your container there are 100 different tools open source tools bash you can write your own bash scripts to manage compliances containers are is strongly isolated from host OS and other containers. No contain containers. Yes, they are controlled by namespaces, but they sh if a container has a permission for network, to, uh, if two containers have permission for network, they both can access network resources and see all the traffic going on. Using orchestration makes containers even more secure. I just showed you Kubernetes attack matrix. No, it does not make it secure. Yes, it can be secured, but by default they are not. 
container images cannot be easily tampered with. No, that is a wrong thing. Container images can also be tampered with. And if you want to see, there have been well documented attacks on containers. So this is one of the most talked uh, talked about container attack. That Docker Hub is a Docker registry where everybody stores their public images. Somebody created a user. They uploaded bunch of uh, images inside uh, their hub, uh, their registry. Once those images were there, somebody downloaded those images. Somebody found okay, something malicious is going on. They reported it. Docker Hub did not see that. People started using that, kept using it, and after some time, it was found. It was found that that particular registry which was created, the images which were inside this particular registry, they were actually crypto miners. That means somebody created an image. So for a simple package, something like Node.js, Python, uh, Alpine Linux, Ubuntu, but also added their own code that is a crypto miner. And once you download that image and run it your, in your own environment, your system was part of their crypto mining network. So this is a very well documented history that okay there have been actual attacks docker hub is a most trusted site for downloading public container images and if they and now look at the time the first reporting happened one first september 2017 the repository got deleted on 10th may 2018 so you just look at the time how much time it took now can you imagine how many people would have downloaded multiple images and maybe running it inside their container uh, environment so yes container security is a requirement that's why you need to build processes you actually take it seriously if you're moving to container environment containers are not secure by default this is a very latest research just last month it, it has happened that around 80 percent of images on docker hub have known vulnerabilities known exploitable vulnerabilities and around 80 percent of them have them. docker hub is doing hard they have built in internal security controls for vulnerability scanning but develop but developers don't have time to update those images if ruby developers are developing container images for rails yes they keep updating it but first they update their own code and those images are not updated as regularly as they should so you need to look at container security because if you are downloading something from docker hub and using it inside your organization so those vulnerabilities are also transferred to your environment as well and if we talk about bug bounty yes so there has been a and there has been some excellent payouts for finding vulnerabilities on the container side so somebody found a vulnerability in shopify which was leading to root access on all instances then there was a Container escape vulnerability, which has been uh, exploited on this website. So you see that container vulnerabilities are real, and it, if you are using container, it, it, uh, it does not mean that you are secure. You will get hacked if it, eventually if you are not following proper processes as you follow in your typical on-prem environment. They are not secure by default. Now coming to the last slide, container security challenges. When you are moving to container. These are the security challenges you will have. First thing is a vulnerability management. That if you are using public images, if you are using images from uh, Docker Hub or any public registry, how you are going to ensure that those images don't have any vulnerability? How you are going to do patch them? How you are going to make sure that okay, whatever vulnerabilities have been reported, they they are not affecting your environment. How you're going to do access control in container environment? Because as I said, that for deploying containers, containers can talk to each other, containers sometimes have root access, and then your orchestration platform, who can deploy containers? Uh, who has access to uh, your container or orchestration platform? Then soft HCA, software component analysis. If you, your software uh, image is using Python, Node, and everything, how you're going to do ensure vulnerabilities and uh, compliance over that? Secret management, how you're going to manage secrets in container environment. You want to change password from UAT to production, how you're going to pass that password. Are you going to pass it as environment variable? Are you going to hard code it inside the container image? How you're going to do it? Audit and logging. As I said, containers are ephemeral. 
that means by the time you go uh, you start doing something containers might be restarted all the data is gone how you're going to do audit how you're going to find out what what is happening inside container and then real time visibility because i said there's no concept of network blocking inside containers containers work on an open network plane so how you're going to ensure one container is talking to another container on what port how they are having that communication and how you're going to control that then the visibility how many containers are running inside your organization because as i said, as I said that okay there are written attacks where somebody has published malicious images on docker hub those mal malicious images can run start their own containers if they have root access so how how do you how you're going to have that visibility these are the security challenges which you need to talk about when you're talking about containers and when you are moving to a container environment so that's it so this is more of an introductory session which i wanted to do i'll probably plan one more deep uh, deeper session on these topics so probably on the container security topic where we'll do some hands-on so if you have any questions you can tell me you can ask me